As a composer, keyboard player, producer and arranger, and film and television scorer, John Capek's unparalleled songwriting prowess has consistently yielded gold, platinum, and diamond cells for some of the most famous international artists spanning decades, including Rod Stewart, Cher, Chicago and Toto, Hart and Bonnie Raitt, Diana Ross, Joe Cocker, and so many more. His exceptional talent and unwavering commitment to musical excellence has rightfully earned him this prestigious honor of induction into the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame. Having received individual honors for their remarkable catalogs, both Mark Jordan and John Capek collectively achieved success, co-pinning the global successful hit Rhythm of My Heart for Rod Stewart, as well as contributing to Bonnie Raitt's Deep Water, crafting Love So High for Cher, and authoring Diana Ross's Piece of Ice. These accolades serve as testament to John's contributions to the music industry, reflecting a nearly 50-year journey that establishes them as a dynamic and influential duo within the music landscape. So without further ado, let's welcome legendary songwriter and Canadian Songwriter Hall of Fame inductee, John Capek, to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Well, it's great to have you, and I understand that uh, you were born in Czechoslovakia, now the Czech Republic, and then moved to Australia where your musical journey began. Why the move to Australia? Well, my uh, um, parents uh, did not appreciate uh, the Russian invasion that happened in, uh, it wasn't an invasion, it was a, a coup in uh, Czechoslovakia as it was then in, uh, in 1948, shortly after the Second World War, and uh, it was time to, to leave, to just simply to, to be free. Well, your father was a concert pianist. What kind of influence did your father have on you as a parent and as a musical mentor? It was interesting that my dad, um, he had trained as a mechanical engineer at one of the most famous oldest universities in, in, in Europe, uh, the Charles University. And um, he had always, uh, his mother was a, a piano player and uh, as he was growing up. And uh, he actually uh, was skilled enough to become a concert pianist. And his uh, piano teacher at the time in his early 20s after he graduated with his engineering degree uh, said, well, you really have to make a choice. You have everything it takes to be a concert pianist or uh, you know, do the other thing. And uh, my dad was uh, really concerned about just financial security and didn't want the roller coaster life of uh, what it took to be a musician. So uh, he chose the path of engineering, which is uh, the complete opposite of what I what I did because I also graduated as a, as an engineer. Uh, I went to school and became a chemical engineer, but I chose the other path. But my dad um, sat me down at the piano from probably the age of around two or three and had me, you know, one finger picking out little melodies, some Czech folk songs. Um, and that's how it all began. So your first foray into uh, piano was what, classical music? Um, there were little Czech folk songs. Um, there's there's a, uh, a song that... Uh, we probably know it's it's a theme from Dvořák's uh, New World Symphony that uh, became a pop song uh, known as Going Home, and and uh, so that one, I think is probably the first little song that uh, that I learned how to play. And, uh, and there were more nursery rhymes and folk songs and little classical themes. But at the age of three, my dad took me to, once we were already in Australia, took me to the most prestigious, famous Russian uh, um, like master, concert piano teacher, um, and uh, wanted an evaluation of whether it was something that uh, I should pursue. And the, concert, the uh, teacher said, absolutely, um, you know, this guy's a prod prodigy and um, don't send him to regular school. He needs to practice at three years old, you know, four to six hours a day. And, uh, and he'll, he'll be famous as a concert pianist. My father said, 
I don't think I want to do that to him. <laughs> so I had a more traditional uh, you know, growing up, but that was always kind of in the back of the suggestion there that music was pretty important. Well, at three years old, do you think you could play for four to six hours a day? <laughs> I have no idea. I, you know, I wonder, you know, I guess Mozart or any of those guys probably did when they were little. Well, what lured you, what, uh, lured you to uh, Canada in 1973? Um, well, growing up in Australia, I uh, went through a whole trajectory of playing in um, blues bands and jam bands and some of them quite successful. And uh, there's always the kind of the, uh, the assumption that a piano player in a, in a rhythm section knows what he's doing, that he knows some theory, which I sort of didn't. I, I was always kind of faking it and making stuff up. And uh, so I, I found my way into the recording session scene uh, as a studio musician, in, uh, mainly in Sydney, in Australia, um, after playing in a lot of bands. And I, I would get hired as the piano player on call for a whole bunch of Australian, quite well-known pop stars at the time. And... Um, I met a fellow who uh, was from originally from Wisconsin, who uh, it was the time of the war in Vietnam, and he didn't want to do that, and uh, found his way to Australia. And he was a singer-songwriter, very talented. Uh, his name is Carl Erickson, and he um, got a record deal in Sydney um, to make an album, and. Um, came to, uh, we were working at EMI Studios on somebody's record and he heard me play and thought that, that I would be a good adjunct to the forthcoming album that he was about to make and we made friends and he said, do you want to come um, help me on my album, which I did in Sydney and then um, he decided Australia wasn't working out for him and he moved to Canada, to Toronto and uh, we, we remained in touch and he called me one day and said, I have a new record deal to make an album, a singer-songwriter type album at the time. He was a bit sort of like a Glenn Campbell kind of, that kind of uh, um, genre. And uh, would you like to come to Canada and help me on my album? So up, always up for an adventure, I, I, off I went to Toronto and met up with, uh, with Carl. And off we went into the studio to record his album in Toronto. So and, uh, when did you get a publishing deal? Um, uh, originally, actually, in Australia, um, a, uh, an A&R or a, a song plugger heard me play, I think, in the studio or perhaps in a club. And uh, uh, improvising was and remains my, uh, my main skill. I, I have a particular way of making stuff up that that has structure that has structure to it beginning middle and end and i hadn't actually written any song songs but he heard my pian pianistic improvisation on rock and roll and pop stuff and uh said you you should you should write songs let me hook you up with a lyricist and which he did in sydney and we got together and wrote a bunch of songs and the songs got cut so that was that was pretty much the beginning, and I remained in in a publishing deal with a few small breaks for probably the, well I still have one uh, continuing you know forty fifty years. So uh, when did you meet Mark Jordan? Mark was um, when I first got to Toronto. I I wasn't writing because I was mainly uh, playing and producing, playing on people's records and doing some production, and. Um, one of the great things about Toronto at the time was that uh, the National Radio Network, which was CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, uh, because Canada is so, it's one of the, uh, in land area, one of the biggest countries in the world in, in land area, with uh, the least dense population, you know, this enormous country with like 30 million people. So the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation was kind of the, the link that, that combined all of Canada together through radio. And they had a program, um, they had uh, outlets, radio outlets in every you know, 
small town, every major city across east to west, across Canada, hundreds of stations. And they had a program to foster Canadian talent. And um, what it was, to, uh, they would make what were called broadcast recordings, which were, um, they'd bring in some talented song uh, songwriter and record him, and then they'd press it up on an album that was not for commercial release, it was simply for distribution to the network of radio stations to get uh, some action for uh, up-and-coming singer-songwriters. So I, I was the uh, piano player on, on call uh, for a lot of these things, and that's where I originally met, met Mark, playing on some of his songs that were recorded for the CBC broadcast recordings. And that was our original meeting. Well, in 1983, your first hit was with Pieces of Ice by Diana Ross. Then you followed that up in the same year with three songs on the Grammy-winning album Bodies and Souls by Manhattan Transfer. That was a big year for you. It was. And I have to attribute Mark for um, making a lot of that happen because at that time we both had publishing deals. In, in We were living in Los Angeles, uh, Mark with Warner Brothers and me with the company that was actually owned by Lawrence Welk. Welk Music that became a, quite a substantial uh, uh, pop music publisher. And uh, we were trying really hard to write songs for the artists that at, at that time were looking for songs. Uh, Kenny Rogers was one of them. Uh, Anne Murray was another one. We were like trying, and, and both of us are pretty non-conformist, uh, um, just by virtue of our limitations. Uh, Mark has... Uh, um, I've forgotten what you name, what you call it, where it's difficult to comprehend what you're reading. Um, there's a, there's oh, uh, dyslexia? A, yeah, he's dyslexic. I can barely read music. So <laughs> you know, uh, even uh, there's something wrong with the eye to, to notation uh, coordination. So we combined our uh, dysfunctions <laughs> and decided to break as many rules as we possibly could to go like sort of anti- Anti Kenny Rogers, and so we uh, built these songs around around breaking rules. Piece of Ice was one of them, and the Three Manhattan Transfer songs. Similarly, I had recently been to the uh, I think it was the Philippines or um, somewhere in Southeast Asia, and heard, yeah, it was the Gamelan music. And uh, so I brought back a sample of some of that stuff and uh, we, one of the Manhattan Transfer songs, This Independence, was based around some of the, some of the music that I've heard in Southeast Asia. Well, sample. how do you approach songwriting when it comes to writing a song for, let's say, an artist versus composing music for a film? I've never composed a song for an artist in my life. Um, the agenda is to write a great song. So um, I've done a lot of teaching, uh, teaching my craft of songwriting, um, including uh, a stint at the Berklee School of Music in Boston. And uh, what I try to convey to students is very little to do with songwriting, a lot to do with creativity. So um, uh, to understand how to, how to start with nothing and create something, is a difficult concept. So uh, my first uh, lecture at, at Berkeley, all the students, there's like 60 students in the room from the songwriting and production uh, classes and a bunch of the, the tenured professors and uh, I set up my little uh, workstation and uh, all the students really excited, you know, ready with their um, clipboards, ready to get the 10 basic rules of hit songwriting. And my, my pitch, which it's always the same when I, when I teach, is when I go into the studio in the morning and set up my uh, workstation and, uh, and get ready to, to do some work on a current song I'm working on or a new song, I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. And I don't want to know. Uh, I want to let the uh, zeitgeist sort of come in. I, I read about like a dozen newspapers a day to get a feel for what's going on in the world. And uh, I, I do have 
skills, pianistic skills, so I have the tools to, to do this stuff, but not a clue who I'm writing for, what I'm writing for, or where it's going to go. I know that it's got going to last about three minutes and it's got a refrain or a chorus. That's about the only rule there is. Wow. Yeah. Now, I've read where you state that music is your primary language and that you can best express yourself when sitting at the piano. Why is that? <laughs> um, I, I see the world as, as, as uh, I'm really a, a great fan of, of abstract art. Um, you know, I can I can look at a Pollock painting or a Roscoe painting, you know, particularly of the of the fifties, the American stuff of the fifties, or impressionist art. Um, I see the world as as being entirely kind of abstract. You know, it's not a bunch of numbers. It's not a you know ones and zeros. Uh, that, that's the ones and zeros are, are, are tools, but you know, a life is sort of you know, pretty kind of difficult to to define in in that in that way so the abstraction of music you know music is not quantifiable and despite what artificial intelligence might uh, might be telling us or predicting but for the moment um, it's it's an abstract medium I'm, I'm creating feelings and, and moods which which can't be quantified uh, I'm looking for um, uh, you know, there's uh, stories that have beginnings, middle and ends. Um, a musical story usually has a beginning, middle and end. But when you uh, translate that into a composition, um, that's an abstraction. It's not something that I can, you know, put, put numbers to and, 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 and construct. Um, what I'm hoping to do is to elicit a response from an audience, an, an emotional response, and uh, a complex emotional response, not just happy or sad, but um, a trajectory of responses where there's a, an entry point, which is an intro, uh, through the story to a final conclusion where we feel some form of resolution. Uh, so it's musical psychology in some ways. Yes, it is. Now, you are best known for co-writing the mega hit Rhythm of My Heart, uh, sung by Rod Stewart. How did that song come about? Well, it, um, Mark and I would get together routinely. Um, Welk Music had, uh, was in, uh, their offices were in the building, the corner of Sunset and Vine in, in uh, Los Angeles. And that was known as the Motown building. Uh, it was not dissimilar to the, the Brill building in New York where a whole bunch of publishers and music companies had their, their offices. And uh, Welk had a small demo studio um, as part of their offices. And we would go in there um, once a week or more often to, to write. And Rhythm of My Heart was just another song that was part of our, our work process. And uh, that particular one, uh, we went in on the, on the weekend once we had the structure kind of uh, written. And uh, unbeknownst to us, uh, it was the middle of summer and the building shut down its air conditioning uh, on that particular weekend. So we're in there, it's about 110 degrees. And uh, Mark said, you know, this has such a nice Celtic uh, vibe to it. We need. We need a bagpipe player. Where are we going to? It's, it's like Sunday in Los Angeles on 120 degrees outside. Where are we going to find a bagpipe player? So, um, we just thought around. We asked the engineer and said, Well, Paul McCartney's in town. He has this song, Mull of Kintyre, and uh, it it's, uh, features bagpipes. Maybe if, you, if we can find out the hotel where he's staying, it's Sunday. The, the bagpipe player probably isn't doing anything. Let's see if we can find him. So we got on the phone. We found out where they were staying. We got to the bagpipe player who was touring with Paul McCartney and said, you know, we're a couple of songwriters. We're, we're in the studio right now. And uh, we, would you have any interest in coming and playing on, on our song? And he said, uh, well, sure. Um, you know, do you want me to wear my kilt? <laughs> and I said, well, no, it's it's an audio recording, it's not video. And so he, he showed up about, you know, within the hour, 
and uh, took him in the studio, and we had some uh, melody lines that we wanted him to play worked out. And uh, he had a lot of trouble uh, playing these lines and afterwards. And I had to stand next to the bagpipes in the studio, kind of singing him these lines. And I have to say, the uh, bag, I, I stood next to the PA at a Led Zeppelin concert. Bagpipes are louder. <laughs> They're just ridiculous. And uh, so I was there for like an hour working with this guy. It's not working out very well, but finally we got it. And he said, well, what is it that you actually do on the Paul McCartney tour? He said, well, I don't really play the bagpipes on the tour. They're all sampled. I just stand there in my kilt and pretend to play. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, yeah. that 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 <laughs> blows the myth right out of the water. <laughs> right. So um, uh, we uh, just submitted the song to our publishers, and uh, it, it just went in the pile of everything that we were doing. And uh, it was sat there. Somebody recorded it. A, a European artist in Holland recorded the song, and then. Um, Rod Stewart was recording an album, and he, which he completed, which ended up being called Vagabond Heart. This is 1990, I think. And uh, the record company listened to his record company, listened to the album, and said, we don't have a single. Does anybody have anything? And the uh, publisher came up with Rhythm of My Heart, said, listen to this. And as an after uh, thought, they recorded that, added it to the album. and. Uh, He's still touring it today, and it's like 40 years later. So. <laughs> wow. So so it was you and Mark that uh, were responsible for having that Scottish flavor in the song? Yeah, absolutely. Well, both Mark and I were always uh, quite fascinated with, with Celtic music of all kinds. Um, Mark's dad was a um, professional uh, singer, big band singer and a folk singer, and... Uh, um, specialized in Canadian uh, folk songs, uh, kind of classical versions of them. And there's a great tradition of Celtic music in the east coast of Canada. It's uh, east coast of Canada is closer to Ireland than it is to other parts of Canada. So there's, there's a great tradition of, of that kind of music. So Mark grew up with that. And I was always fascinated. Um, and I, I, I attribute my fascination Celtic music because I read somewhere that the first uh, archaeological finding of bagpipes was in uh, in Bohemia. Um, so there was a bunch of marauding, raping, pillaging Celtic tribes, you know, swept across across uh, Bohemia where my ancestors came from and left a bunch of bagpipes there. <laughs> and so perhaps that uh, was part of my influence. I don't know. Well, it ended up being a great signature song for Rod Stewart. Absolutely, and it still is. Um, yeah, and amazing. still, and still, I don't think anybody else could do that song except Rod Stewart. Well, a another group did. Um, I've forgotten their name now, but um, it, it has been recorded by other people. And uh, he now uses it as a tribute to... Um, uh, the Ukraine and to Zelensky and there's a huge backdrop that he puts up on stage. So every show he, he dedicates the um, the song, which previously it's, it's an anti-war song basically, and uh, so he'd have some kind of graphic up and for the last uh, couple of years it's been dedicated to the, the people of the Ukraine and to the fight for um, you know, freedom from oppression, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it's it. It's just been that you know. It's amazing that that song now is what um, is it almost thirty five years old now, and it still sounds as new new today as it did back then. And that's always the objective. So when I'm when I'm writing uh, or producing or arranging, I, I try everything I can to not put a timestamp. On, on what it is that I'm doing, um, it's one of the criterion uh, the criteria that, that, I, that I have to um, to write an anthem, to write something that's timeless, that uh, really doesn't have that timestamp, so it, it'll still be relevant 50 years from now, as that song is.
Well, you know, some some songwriters have that intuition when they write certain songs that they just know it's a hit. Have you ever had that feeling on any particular songs that you've written that did end up being hits? I have that song with every song. I have that feeling with every song I write. <laughs> I think they're all hits, but I, you know, I really, really don't know. Uh, um, often, if I do, my timing is way off. Um, Rhythm of My Heart was written several years before I recorded it. Um, the uh, current song that Bonnie Ray has, "Blame It on Me," was written, I think, three or four years before she recorded it. So. Um, uh, that sort of speaks to the the idea of making songs timeless. If, if uh, a song is three or four years old, or seven or eight years old, still is relevant uh, when when it's recorded. Uh, it means I've sort of achieved my my goal. Well, you know, you bring up "Blame It on Me," and I was going to ask you about that song because since you love the blues, um, and with the song "Blame It on Me." It has this wonderful gospel organ sound, <clears throat> and there are so many flavors to this song. What was the inspiration behind uh, writing it? Well, I'd say one of my my greatest influences was uh, Ray Charles, um, um, and underrated um, Aretha Franklin, both as uh, piano players and uh, Billy Preston. Um, as piano players, and they they all had a, a, and the roots of that music really was in Mahalia Jackson's piano player. I've forgotten her name, so she almost invented the style, and so there's this tra trajectory from Mahalia Jackson. And I'm just talking about the piano, the keyboard playing, Mahalia Jackson uh, to Aretha, to uh, Nina Nina Simone would be another one, classically trained. Um, not as gospel as the rest, uh, Billy Preston and Ray Charles, and um, um, and uh, then on the, on the other side, uh, Leon Russell. So uh, a song for you uh, would be, you know, if you hear Ray Charles's version of that, or uh, a bunch of other uh, songs that he did. It's it's totally church. And, and that's a huge, huge influence on my playing. There are particular chords and changes that, that are all part of that tradition. So blame it on me, you know, if it's right in there, it's definitely part of that. Yeah, I love that gospel, that gospel organ sound, uh, especially if you can pull out a Hammond B3 here and there. But, uh, uh, and of course, you know, when it comes to an organ, along with the blues, it's just a perfect combination. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's funny that I, I have never been a, a B3 player. So, uh, the reason being uh, that it, uh, the keys don't have uh, any touch response. So it's all uh, levers and, uh, and buttons. And I prefer to play uh, an acoustic piano. I have a, a 1883 Steinway piano behind me there where most of my songs will start there because of the touch response, because I can make the keys sound a certain way simply by the way that I touch them. And the thought of pu pulling a bunch of levers and pushing a bunch of buttons has never appealed to me, so I really admire uh, B3 players who know how to do that. And uh, you know, Ray Charles is one of them. <laughs> and Billy well, Preston. Oh, indeed, and, and Ray Charles was a master, and you had another song, uh, Take Me Home by Joe Cocker. That mm -hmm. song um, has such a very strong gospel sound to it. I mean, uh, did you have gospel influences growing up? Uh, not. My, I, there's a little story about that song, uh, but um, my influences growing up was um, uh, I had a radio beside my, my bed uh, like from the age of about four uh, on, and it, it was a shortwave radio. And I'm sitting in Melbourne, Australia, and I'm twirling the dials of the shortwave stadium radio, and I came across the Voice of America. The Voice of America um, had was playing uh, was playing basically jazz, uh, and jazz of the fifties, uh, and uh, blues, and I just just got it just got got me somewhere you know right here 
<laughs> and uh, and I never never let go of it. So the the Joe Cocker song "Take Me Home." I did a stint in uh, I did an album of my own in South Africa, and um, while while I was there, I it was like a an archivist or something. I collected little bits of music from that I could find, um, not dissimilar to uh, Lady Smith Mombasa that stuff, the Paul Simon stuff, but all the roots behind that, where he got that music. And I had access to a record company's music library, and I listened to all this stuff, and uh, and created my album, uh, sort of based on little bits and pieces that I that I found there. And that's how the Joe Cocker song uh, began. So it's um, African gospel, which is a little different from uh, American gospel. Uh, different changes and different different sensibility, but that's where that came from. Yeah, because your solo album, um, was it Indaba? Is that the name of the <laughs> album? Yep. And that, I know, has some of that African... Well, all of the artists on that album, or all the musicians, they're from South Africa, correct? Oh, well, most of them uh, are the same ones that played on the Paul Simon album. Actually, the bass player, the guitar player, uh, uh, one of the organ um, uh, accordion players. Yeah. So, uh, and in, in Daba, the word means uh, meeting. Uh, in uh, one of the South, you know, there's 12 different uh, African dialects that people speak for in Dalit. Yeah, yeah well, well, I actually listened to that album and picked up that even on that album, there were a couple of, uh, well, I, a couple of gospel songs on there. I think what one of them was what, um, what the Lord is my shepherd. Absolutely. Yeah. We just basically took the psalm and the psalm, how you, I don't know how you pronounce it, and, uh, and set it to music uh, as, as, a, as a thing. And you and, recorded uh, was, that. Yeah, no, go ahead, John. I, I, I was a fascinating. I was there when they released Man, Mandela from jail. And uh, so I was in the midst. I, I was there a couple of times, uh, once on, for a different artist, and the second time I went back for my, my album. Um, I think it was the second time when uh, I was there when uh, Mandela was released from jail and we didn't know in the midst of everything whether there was going to be a revolution there or you know, they're just going to kill all the white people or if it, it would turn into a big party. Fortunately for me, it turned into a big party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I read that you were there when Mandela was released from prison what was the atmosphere like at that time? I mean, like you said, you know, it could go either way, but when he was released, what was the initial reaction of South Africa? You know, it was almost like just a sigh of relief more, more than anything else. Uh, the record company that I was working with had a black division and a white division. And, uh, you know, the, the, the cultural differences were remarkable. And the artists that I was working with on the previous trip was uh, from the coloured community, so uh, that was from uh, Cape Town, where the coloured community were, were mixed race, and there were the full African race and the, the white people. Uh, Japanese people were considered white, Chinese people were considered black. I mean, it was it was a nutty thing. There were separate bus lines for uh, you know depending on what race you were. So I, I was mixing. In both on both sides, you know, my friend would take me on a black bus as the only white guy, and uh, we would go record in the, in the uh, in Soweto, um, uh, or uh, and pick up the the choirs or some of the musicians that we wanted wanted to work with, who'd who'd come come into the studio. Um, so it was a remarkable time, but you know the atmosphere, I guess. Was, I should tell you one story. The accountant uh, in the, at the record company was this black guy who'd gone to university and become an accountant and had his office there. And we, we sat down to lunch one day in the middle of my recording. And totally educated guy, you know, just uh, shooting, just chatting. And he said, Man, I, I have such a dilemma. Um, I'm about to get married. And, and, uh, I don't know what to do. The dowry is 55 cows. And I, I don't know how to get them. 
It was part of the part of the tradition that you belonged to. You know, you were supposed to bring fifty, or, or at least the equivalent of fifty-five cows, um, as the dowry to to his wedding. So, this kind of crazy mix of, of influences and cultures was was fascinating. And in fact, I think my time in South Africa was uh, was a time of wonder. You know, that that these people could. Um, after he was released, that they would co coexist at all. Um, yeah. It's still the richest country in on the continent, and the troubles, any troubles they have now, there now, is because of um, illegal immigration, because they, there's work there that uh, people can't find in the rest of Africa, so they, they come down to South Africa looking for work and cause a lot of trouble. Um, Beyond that, it's a, it's a fascinating place. Uh, I would go back there in a minute to make more music. Yeah, I have a friend who lives in uh, Cape Town, and I've talked to um, Jonathan Butler, the amazing uh, recording artist, and others who they just l absolutely fall in love with South Africa. Yep, yeah, absolutely. And now, the music John, no, go ahead. Yeah, the musical influence is undeniable. It's a little similar to Jamaica. It's a bit like that, you know, where I've been to Jamaica to record, and you can't you can't escape, you know, that the the music that's, that's so much part of the culture. Well, you were recently inducted into the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame. What does that mean to you? It it has tremendous meaning because of the company I get to keep. So uh, Canada is a small country, but the other inductees into the Hall of Fame are uh, Joni Mitchell, Neil Young, Robbie Robertson, uh, um, yeah, yeah, a whole bunch of Gordon Lightfoot, uh, I'm trying to think of all, all the others, but um, uh, Leonard Cohen. Uh, and w one of the things I, I should mention that one of the main songwriting influences for me is Canadian, and the reason for that is the Canadian lyric sensibility. So if you if you listen to a Joni Mitchell, or uh, particularly a Leonard Cohen, or a Gordon Lightfoot, there's a particular way of um, expressing lyrics in a sort of a lyric poetry sense. It has that ab abstraction, that uh, abstract imagery. It just fascinates me, and, and uh, I can put up a good lyric written by one of these people, and the song just kind of makes itself, because uh, there's, there's um, a meeting of the minds in, in, in we're painting a picture. We're not making a construct, which is more of a, my understanding of how songs are written here in Nashville where uh, everything has to kind of make sense and be structured. So uh, I play you know, my abstractions to Canadian publishers and they don't, they don't know what they're listening to. It's a, it's a whole other world. Well, you know, I, I read that um, in your bio that there is this, there's this, this distinct difference between Canadian songwriters and American songwriters. And like you had just alluded to, the Canadians are, seem to be a little bit more poetic. Um, if I think back, I think one of the songwriters, if I could just, the, the one I think that was probably one of the most poetic that I know of was Dan Fogelberg. Now, I don't know if he mm -hmm. was Canadian or not, but the, his lyrics of his songs, sometimes I'd sit there and listen to him, I'm like, who thinks like that? I mean, but in a very positive way, because it's just this poetic artistry that just comes out. And you alluded that uh, when it came to uh, Canadian songwriters. Um, why is there that difference? I, <laughs> I think because it's, it's so incredibly cold in Canada. There's nothing better to do than sit in the house and write poetry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, it's part of part of that, and and it's um, I'm not sure I can I understand it myself, but your abstraction is is permitted. You're allowed to be abstract, and uh, not so much uh, in uh, an American sensibility. You know, we, uh, American culture. We want to be 
want to we we look for structure and, and resolution. We so I, like just, yeah, because see now you're living in Nashville, and that's probably the highest concentration of songwriters in the whole world. Um, what's it like writing there? Um, it's really odd because I still write mainly with Canadians. So the current project I'm working on, um, uh, I'm writing to, uh, for an album with an artist named Andrew Matheson, who's Canadian. He currently lives in London in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, he's been there for a while. And he's an interesting fellow. He uh, was in uh, a uh, band called the Hollywood Brats uh, in the 70s that were contemporaries of the New York Dolls like totally punk, as punk as you can get. But he is one of the greatest wordsmiths that uh, I've come across. And he wrote the lyrics to Blame It On Me. Um, and I uh, got a record deal and we're, we're writing his album now. And uh, wonderful. Just, uh, I put, he'll send me a lyric I put up on the keyboard and the song just kind of makes itself. Uh, so living in Nashville, um, I really can't think uh, the other people I've been writing with are Australian. I don't think I've written with any, I, I've tried, I, I have to say I've tried, not, not, not successfully, uh, to write with uh, Nashville writers. So have you written any country songs yet? I've tried, but um, you know, it's not, it's not really my the culture that I understand or they come from. The attraction of Nashville to me, firstly the lifestyle, people are really friendly, there's great social interaction and there's there's a, a bunch of friends that I've made here who I work with on various projects. Um, my closest friend lives five minutes down the street, um, his name's Bruce Dees and he um, uh, owned a studio in Augusta, Georgia um, that recorded all of the early um, James Brown records and uh, went on as a studio musician uh, after several years doing that. Uh, Bruce went on to work as a studio musician with Ray Charles and with Chet Atkins and uh, had 21 number one hits with uh, Ronnie Millsap. So he and I work together. He has a studio in his house and whatever projects I get. He's usually either the guitar player or the background singer or the engineer, or, you know, he's part of it. His best friend is part of the original Muscle Shoals rhythm section that played on um, with Aretha Franklin and the Staple Singers, Release Yourself, he, he was a keyboard player on that. So um, he's uh, Bruce's best friend. Uh, the other guy that we're, we're involved with and do a lot of projects with is um, the bass player with John Mayer for the last 10 years. Um, so we have this group of, of uh, people that I hang out with like on a regular, regular basis. We meet once a week at the local pub and tell war stories and work together on projects. Um, so pretty much everyone you me I, I meet here in Nashville as a story, not dissimilar, yeah, I, uh, Bruce, oh, he also sang with Elvis. Uh, so, um, you know, everybody's got a story like that. And, uh, so when I, when I hire these musicians or work with them, they bring that body of experience with them to, to a project, you know, whatever, you know, went on with on the James Brown record, well, you know, you learn from that and you use it. Indeed, yeah. Nashville is one of the best cities in America, and I've I filmed in Nashville for like three years, and it's still one of my most fa favorite places to go to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we definitely enjoy enjoy being here for sure, but for the cold weather when it when it gets cold, and uh, the tornadoes are not much fun either. Oh, I, I've been in Nashville twice when the tornadoes hit, so I know exactly what that is like. So, yeah. but I looked at your um, your long list of, uh, I guess, the albums that your songs appeared on. Um, mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, Australia, but I also noticed too that you had worked with some uh, artists from the Czech Republic. Yep, um, I tried. Um, 
my my uh, family owned a house in in the suburbs in Prague, and uh, uh, after the uh, uh, the uh, revolution where they became a free country again, um, I made some efforts to try and reclaim my family's house, which had been uh, nationalized by the communist regime. And uh, so I went back to, to Prague to see if I could uh, reclaim my family home. And while I was there, I had some meetings with uh, music people and they listened to my songs. And, uh, and uh, so some of them got recorded by some of the best known legacy artists in, in the Czech Republic at the time. Um, so it was kind of an odd experience. It was uh, frustrating because I never managed to get the house back. And uh, so there was not much reason to go back. I mean, it's a small, very small population. And, uh, uh, and, well, in uh, your really long uh, history of music, what is so far, what's been your most uh, memorable moment? You know, playing live is, uh, I always had this fantasy um, that one day Mick Jagger, Mick Jagger was going to call me and, and ask me to join his little blues band. Um, you know that that never happened, but but there's something exhilarating about about uh, being with a band. It doesn't really matter a small club or a big uh, you know, venue. Uh, I I really really enjoy that that instant uh, feedback. The other, the other the the most memorable experience happens fairly regularly. I mean, I was in this local supermarket here in the suburbs of Nashville. Um, uh, shopping with my wife and the PA comes on and there's rhythm on Rod Stewart ringing and singing rhythm of my heart in the supermarket um, you know, you know, decades after it was recorded and or I turn on the car radio and he hears something that I've done um, you know, it's always incredibly fulfilling to, to have that well what is what's next for you um, we're uh, <laughs> actually going to form a band, Bruce and me, Bruce, the uh, uh, guy who has the James Brown uh, experience and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, David, the uh, bass, John Mayer's bass player and me and uh, some drummer and going to record some stuff and see what happens. I'm, I'm currently writing with my friend in the UK, my Canadian friend who, who has a, a recording contract and uh, we've been writing the bulk of his album uh, together, and uh, whatever you know, whatever comes next. I've never been entrepreneurial. I kind of sit in this little room, and uh, and uh, things seem, fortunately, to have come my way um, because I don't have that skill. Uh, a lot of my contemporaries and peers have tremendous salesmanship skills. They can go. One of my friends. Uh, wrote a song, a uh, prolific songwriter, he would go into Clive Davis's office uh, over the years and say, hey, Clive, this is undeniable. You, you have to, you have to, you know, you, you've got to do something with it. And I, could, I could never do that. It's not my personality. But that's my friend who wrote um, Let's Get Physical for Olivia Newton-John and uh, Hard Habit to Break for Chicago and, you know, a whole bunch of, uh, he wrote Genie in a Bottle for Christine Aguilera. So he could walk in with those credits and pretty much be heard. Um, and we, uh, he's he's a co-writer on the on the uh, Joe Cocker "Take Me Home" song. Uh, we we got stuck on the bridge and couldn't figure out what to do with the bridge. So we got, called Steve and said, "You know, write us a let's get physical, you know, bridge section for the song, which he, which he helped us do." Yeah. Well, that, that's pretty incredible. And I I think you were probably just the silent hit maker. I guess <laughs> if I had to describe myself, yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the program. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, you can learn more about John Kapek at johnkapek.com and check out his incredible, and I mean incredible, legacy of music. And John, I, I've got to extend congratulations to you on the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame induction. Thank you. I appreciate it. Here it is right here. <laughs>
<laughs> and well deserved. How about that? Yeah, that's probably that's probably made from what uh, one of the Canadian glaciers. It looks like it. <laughs> well, John, it's it's been an absolute honor and a pleasure to uh, talk with you today and to talk about your musical legacy. Thank you, I appreciate it, and thanks for the interesting questions and allowing allowing me to rave on here. <laughs> oh, absolutely, and uh, well, keep cranking out those hits, and and hopefully. One day soon, maybe you'll be able to sit down with an American songwriter in Nashville and actually <laughs> create a hit. So may, maybe put in some of that, uh, uh, add in some of that Canadian, Czech, Australian flavor there. That or a Taylor Swift would be nice too. <laughs> I would say so. And uh, well, I know that Beyonce just be just hit uh, number one on the country charts. So uh, th there's yeah. another goal right there. Could happen. <laughs> Could happen is right. And uh, again, John, thank you so much for being on the program. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank all of you for watching and listening. And you can catch all of the replays of our interviews on our YouTube channel or listen on a dozen audio platforms in which we are on, such as iTunes and Spotify and others. And as for me, hey, keep rocking and rolling, and I'll see you next time.